All right. I think we're going to go ahead and get started, um, and we'll turn it over to Kelly Myers, our Eastern Tallgrass LCC uh, coordinator, um, for a brief introduction. Well, thank you. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I'm calling in remotely. Well, I guess everyone is, but I'm on, I'm on my cell phone right now. Can, can you hear me okay? Yep, you're good. Kristen, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. I was doing thumbs up. Okay. I realized you can't see that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, hello, everyone, and, and welcome to this call. Thank you for bearing with us um, as we are working through some technical issues. We'll kind of work over the next week or so and make sure that um, we get those resolved um, so we can get started right away next uh, for our next call. But, um, but again, thank you so much for um, joining us, and, and many thanks to Abby for organizing the series and, and the call. Um, I'm Kelly Myers. I'm the new Eastern Tallgrass Prairie Coordinator, and some of you may have may know me from my role with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. Um, I oversaw the, the Fish and Wildlife uh, programs there, and I sat as the steering committee co-chair of the Eastern Tallgrass Prairie. So the learning curve has not been as big, but it's been pretty big, and um, Gwen and Kristen have certainly made it much easier for me over the last couple of weeks. Um, I'll keep my remarks short so we can dive right into the substance, but I just wanted to tell you how excited I am um, about this opportunity to come together as our community over the next couple of weeks. Um, this is something we're experimenting with to do this kind of webinar every Wednesday so that we have a way of, of reaching out within our partnerships and, um, and within our team here and highlighting what the LCC is, is really working on and you as members of the LCC are working on. Um, we're hoping that this will launch a way for everyone to get more involved and that's something that as I come on board I'm going to be experimenting with different ways to um, engage our, um, our, our membership and our steering committee and all of the um, people who work with our LCC. Um, as you know, we work across a varying landscape. We've got prairies and rivers. Um, we have our working lands, and we have a lot of really important urban centers. So we have a lot of variation and a lot of opportunity. Um, the, work, the, the, the work that we're going to be talking about over the, the next few weeks is really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and I think what I would say to all of you is if you have ideas, you want to present, you want to engage um, with this LCC more, um, certainly reach out to me, reach out to Abby um, if, if it's a presentation you want to give. Um, and we will find ways to make sure that your voice is heard and that the, the work that you're doing um, can coordinate with the work that's going on, you know, in other places across our broad region. So. Again, um, I'm going to be reaching out to all the different steering committees and, and um, groups that we work with in this LCC over the coming weeks to, to figure out more ways to engage, but we hope that you find this webinar series um, informative and enlightening and a, a good way to participate, and, and many thanks for being here. So with that, I will turn it over to Abby um, to get, get this going, and thanks again. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Kelly. Okay. So, but I'm really excited to talk to you about our efforts in St. Louis of dealing with urban monarch conservation. And I want to focus a little bit on how to work with or through local governments because I think it's a little bit unique in our our approach. And we're not a conservation agency, obviously, but we've had some some good success uh, in large part thanks to the support and partnership of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And I'll get into that. Okay. So, um, just real quick. Who am I? I'm the Sustainability Director for the City of St. Louis. I work in the Mayor's Office. I work in City Hall, which is this uh, lovely French Gothic building here behind the Monarch Garden. Can you still hear me okay? I'm hearing some other people as well. Okay. So. <laughs> Okay, so here we are, um, City of St. Louis, and what I'm going to be talking about today is Milkweeds for Monarchs, the St. Louis Butterfly Project, or writ large urban monarch right? conservation. And I'm right. going to try and share with you 10 tips, if you will, on working with local governments in particular to achieve monarch conservation. Uh, just to orient you very quickly, why we're even talking about the, we are at the confluence of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. We're just, just south of it at the confluence, which is, of course, the largest watershed in North America. So um, that's one tie into the eastern 
Tugruff and Big Rivers Landscape Conservation Cooperative. The other tie-in, geographically speaking, of course, is prairies. And if you look here on the upper left-hand corner, you see a map of pre-settlement Missouri, the orange areas, that is where Tallgrass Prairie was historically in Missouri. The circle, the white circle, is the city of St. Louis. And if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, you see a map showing half a dozen or so prairie areas within the city of St. Louis. This is historically speaking. Of course, um, that's not our conditions necessarily today. Well, as the monarch flies, what would a monarch see as it uh, went over, oops, shoot, St. Louis? Here you have um, overlaid on our, on our prairie backdrop the monarch's migration route going northward in the yellow arrows and south over the, for their winter migration in the red. And you can see, again, they really kind of go up and back through the St. Louis area in the circle in the middle. So um, the Tuggeris Prairie, as you all know, is the ecosystem that has things like milkweed and other native plants that the monarch butterfly depends on. So having uh, Tuggeris Prairie around is really important for the viability of the monarch. And unfortunately, we also know that some 99% of Tigress prairies are no longer, which makes habitat loss one of the biggest threats to the ongoing survival and success of the monarch butterfly. So what, is, what would a monarch butterfly see if it flew over the city of St. Louis today? And if it went over one of our 108 city parks, it might see something like this. And this is a monarch garden, a large pollinator garden planted. Um, we have 62 square miles of land, another four miles of Mississippi River or waterfront, about 315,000 people. And um, just to sort of put a couple of punctuation points here, 315,000 people, well, that's a lot of people who, if, as you're seeing in the background here, can uh, help install, put uh, plants in and care for these gardens and enjoy them and become champions of uh, monarch habitat and in other conservation areas going forward. Also, don't forget that a city uh, can be a big player and partner in your efforts. Um, the city in St. Louis happens to be actually a large employer and also is a large land owner and a large land manager. Just in our city parks alone, we manage approximately 4,000 acres of land. Um, just a little bit of a sidebar note. Uh, related to that, we have uh, a number of parks, green space, trails in the city, forested areas, waterways, and so forth. These are a lot of different conservation opportunities. So my remarks today, of course, are specific to monarch butterflies, but almost all of them, frankly, could be applied to any species of flora or fauna uh, if you're trying to reach people in the urban area and tap into that potential. So up in the left-hand corner, you see our um, urban tree canopy, and the right-hand uh, demonstration showing just how many people have, or households have access to public, public parks and green spaces in the city. Um, so I don't think I need to um, dwell too long on this point. I think most on the call will know that uh, we can't we can't go at this nature protection and conservation restoration effort alone. Nature needs people. People can ha help in a number of different ways, whether it's uh, stewardship or monitoring or restoration or education, outreach, or all different kinds of things that really um, nature could use the help of people when it comes to monarchs and milkweeds, which is up in the left-hand corner. <laughs> and right-hand corner, you get people planting these species, which, as I mentioned, habitat loss is, is a real concern for their ongoing survival and success of the population. And then um, taking care of our habitats, uh, prescribed fire, of course, happens uh, a lot with um, people doing the, that management. And um, citizen stewardship is in the left-hand corner capturing the uh, migration of the monarchs in particular and other things and monitoring and so forth. So these are all really important ways that nature needs people. Um, but don't forget that 
people also need nature, and whether it's for their health and well-being, their improved education, community, economic benefits, all of these things have been well documented in research. There are um, numerous reports and studies showing that uh, there are measurable benefits that people can derive from connecting with nature. And a lot of these things are incorporated uh, in the city of St. Louis's approach to sustainability. We have a triple bottom line approach. And uh, this is uh, the, the individual in the middle shown there is Mayor Slate. And you'll see lots of pictures of him <clears throat> in this presentation. On the left hand side, our sustainability plan, which was adopted in 2013. It's the first sustainability plan for the city of St. Louis. And Mayor Slate also issued a a short list, if you, will, if you will, of action items to implement the sustainability items within that sustainability plan. And that's the sustainability action agenda in the middle. And one of those action items is on the right-hand side to double the current eco-literacy rate by launching a program to foster an enhanced connection between people and urban natural resources. For the very reasons that I just summarized about people needing nature and nature needing people. So uh, the first part of that action agenda item said that we would double our eco-literacy rate. Well, how were we going to double it if we didn't know where we were at that moment? So we needed to conduct a baseline eco-literacy assessment. Uh, trouble was, there was no such thing. Uh, what is an eco-literacy assessment tool? So um, this may have been the first time that I, I reached out to the experts in the local community with expertise in conservation and biology and ecology, and my colleagues live at the Missouri Botanical Garden and St. Louis Zoo, and they helped me develop a, an eco-literacy survey that we, through the city, could then disseminate throughout the city and gather baseline information. And uh, this was really, I think, the start of many, many partnerships and, um, and collaborations. Again, you'll hear several of them in this presentation. But it's uh, a really fabulous opportunity to tap into the various expertise and, and like in the city uh, example here, their dist distribution mechanisms or uh, avenues that they have at their disposal. So this is a really great partnership. We developed the tool, we came back with this information. So what did we find out? It was really uh, instructive. It, we had a good response rate, people from all over the city and all different kinds of demographics. and. Um, and we found that about 87% of the people felt that it was important to live near quality outdoor green spaces. Well, that, that's a, a nice um, uh, endorsement of the importance of what we're trying to do here, that people felt that it was important, it was a priority to them. And then we asked the follow-up or related question, and we said, well, why? What, why, why was it important to you? What are the most, what are your priorities are the most important reasons? And you can see here in the bar chart, the number one reason that people felt that it was important was because of the impact on their health and well-being. And even, frankly, the second item was on future generations. And, um, and third, still a respectable number, but was trees and other plants. But uh, most notably, the, the, the top two answers here were the impact on people. And that is why they felt it was important to have these quality outdoor spaces. So that's really instructive, I think, that for to implement the second part of that sustainability action agenda item, we said that we would launch an initiative to foster an enhanced connection between people and urban natural resources. So again, we built on our partnership with the Missouri Botanical Garden and also added in the Missouri Department of Conservation, and we launched this City of St. Louis Urban Vitality and Ecology Initiative. And this was um, to do a lot of things, and it is still ongoing, but it is essentially to try and connect people with nature where they live, work, play, pray. And, uh, and we did that in a number of different ways. Okay, so let me start delving more specifically into the monarch element. Let me ask you, what you think is the urban difference in urban monarch conservation or urban monarch programs. And uh, I will 
lunch, race to the punchline and tell you what I think the urban difference is, and it's the people. And a lot of folks are working on monarch conservation across the country, or frankly, across several countries, and um, doing remarkable work. And But what this incredible asset that's available in the urban core is people. Again, be, because it's uh, of the importance that they can contribute to the equation. So um, about the same time that we were doing all of this eco-literacy studying and uh, releasing the action agenda, those first reports of the precipitous decline in the population of monarchs <clears throat> started coming out. And uh, I just sort of serendipitously, serendipitously mm -hmm, uh, raised to our mayor, Mayor Slay, and said, I wonder if there's something that we can do about this, that we can help of the monarch population, there's a really great story about how he responded that tapping into a childhood memory that he had of seeing clouds of monarchs pass over the city of St. Louis and how he wanted to help children of this era have that same experience one day. And so he was behind it from day one, and on Earth Day of 2014, he launched um, Milkweeds for Monarchs, the St. Louis Butterfly Project. So here's my, my first tip. Find, find a champion, uh, someone with influence, someone with exposure or visibility, someone who people respect. doesn't have to be the mayor, can be a, a singer, can be a sports figure. But um, in the municipal context, uh, there's nobody more respected uh, than our mayor. And he, was, he has been an incredible champion for monarch conservation. And what he did was uh, launch this initiative with a challenge to plant 250 monarch gardens, and a commitment to plant 50 of those um, with city resources. And that was really just sort of the beginning. How could, what would it be to have uh, 250 of these gardens across the city of St. Louis? And then he started sharing some of the tips and resources through outlets such as the U.S. Conference of Mayors across the country, and here's an article on best practices. So I like to say that we have a mayor for monarchs. And you can see here on the left-hand side uh, images that the mayor took himself of monarchs in different stages of their life cycle in his own backyard. And if my computer was working, which I'm certain it's not, nope, um, that there would be a, oh, maybe it is. A, this is a little video that the mayor captured on his phone of the monarch emerging from its chrysalis off the siding of his own home in St. Louis. So that's pretty cool to have the mayor going around town and showing these things with people in the city. Um, the picture here is uh, the Monarch Garden after just one growing season at City Hall. And uh, the interpretive panel that we put in at that Monarch Garden. So here's the mayor amidst about 100 different volunteers in one of our city parks. And they are participating in something called the do good, have fun day. This is something that Bud Light sponsored. We have um, AB InBev in St. Louis. So, you know, sometimes people think, oh, well, if you're doing good, how can you have fun? But the point here was, well, you can do both at the same time. This is a, a mutually beneficial outcome. And so for these 100 people, they're clearly having a nice time having a beer. As they've just planted this monarch, very large um, pollinator garden in this park. They are doing good and having fun. Win-win for these people. Well, similarly, um, there are win-win opportunities when it comes to monarch butterflies because you can consider what the people can do for the monarchs, but also you can consider what monarchs can do for the people. So my second tip is to seek and plan for results associated with those win-win outcomes. And I skipped over... This is my favorite Gary Larson, there are two Gary Larson comics here about the importance of both respecting your perspective and diverse approaches and priorities and communicating and choosing the correct language to reach your audience. Because if you, if you don't pay attention to these things at the outset and along the way, targeting your audience and how they hear things and what's important to them, 
you've um, potentially missed a big opportunity or sealed the fate of uh, your project. Okay, so uh, in St. Louis, if you haven't had a chance to visit, there are some really lovely places, some beautiful spots with rich biodiversity and, and strong ecosystem functions and opportunities for folks like these uh, who are doing some research in uh, Forest Park, one of our, our, it is our largest park in the city of St. Louis, some really wonderful places that are already great habitat for pollinators and monarch butterflies. But there are also places that look like this. And this is a, um, an image shown from Old North St. Louis. And unfortunately, it is not unique. We have some 20,000 vacant properties in the city of St. Louis. Um, several of them have dilapidated structures on them, like this one. And uh, if you look at the map on the upper right-hand side, you see a bunch of pinkish. And those are the vacant properties. Uh, this was a couple of years old, but more or less 20,000 of them in the city of St. Louis. Um, these situations creating blight and um, distress on the community, these are very expensive and very uh, challenging issues that the city needs to put front and center and spend a lot of time and resources uh, attending to these situations to try and improve them. And there are other ones as well that need attention, whether it's uh, education or um, safety and so forth. The point being, a city has a lot, a lot on its plate, a lot of things um, demanding a municipal leader's time and attention and resources and those of uh, the departments that work for that municipal leader. And it's important to respect those needs and those priorities and to hear them. And uh, let me give you one example. Uh, if you can respect them and not try and say that one is more or less important than the other, you can still end up with at least acceptable outcomes, I think. So let me just give a quick example of our situation with mosquitoes and especially with the different viruses uh, going around. And people are very concerned in St. Louis about the impacts of mosquito bites and the health implications. And our health department gets hundreds of phone calls every year saying, please come and fog our, our public spaces, our alleys and, and streets so that uh, we don't risk being bitten um, by or having disease caused by mosquito bites. So hundreds of those calls. And, um, and, they, and to be responsive, the health department of the city of St. Louis sends out people to do those that spring. Well, of course, we know that what's effective in uh, attending to the child, the, the um, danger of mosquitoes can also be uh, a threat to the health and viability of pollinators and monarchs. So the question is um, a little daunting if you say, well, what's more important? the health considerations of people or the health considerations of monarch butterflies? And no one wants to have to answer that question. It doesn't need to be a choose mutually exclusive type outcome. Instead, to respect that there are these differences and say, okay, is there a way that we can find an acceptable outcome? So now we have not just a number to call to have your alley sprayed, for mosquitoes. We also have a number to call that citizens can call so that they prevent the spraying on, in, their, um, in their own. So uh, finding that um, respectful outcome is really important. So I'm going to start running through some um, examples of leadership and, and other tips here because we're, um, we started late and we're running short on time. So um, Mayor Slay has not helped launched the Mayor's Monarch Pledge in the National Wildlife Federation, and he's shown here with um, Colin O'Mara, the head of that. And I think it's really important to let municipalities do things like that and lead by example. And here are some of the pictures of those uh, fire stations, those 50 monarch gardens that Mayor Slay said that he would do as um, a show of good faith, a demonstration that he was going to walk the talk with city resources. Um, also, all along the way, we have partnered with many, many partners, as I have mentioned. Um, and I'll just, okay, another way that a city can be really useful in a conservation agency or entity's efforts to, um, to achieve conservation in the urban core is to develop appropriate materials that can make it 
user-friendly and as easy as possible for people in the urban core to take action. And so here we took the guesswork out of starting Monarch Gardens. We did everything from tell them what plants to use, how to plant them, how to take care of them, where to get the plants, and um, put them all together on flash drives and um, upload them to our website just to make it as easy as possible. So uh, here's my tip number five, to think through these logistics, trying to make it as easy as possible. Uh, the first year that we had our program, there was literally a run on milkweed. We said, we, monarchs, they need milkweed, and people, they, all of the nurseries were um, sold out in, in short order. And we hadn't thought through, well, where are you going to get sufficient milkweed stock? We didn't have any idea it was going to be so popular. So in the second year, we not only worked with the nurseries to ensure that we had the appropriate stock so that people could follow through, we put together a one-stop shopping opportunity, a convenient order your monarch garden in a box. And people showed up, and some 75 people showed up, got their monarch plants, went home, and that afternoon, boom, they had a monarch garden. We tried to make it as easy as possible because we heard people didn't like running all around town looking for things. Okay. Other things we did was um, provide signs that uh, help inform and also serve as incentives if they would register their newly created monarch gardens on a map that I will show you in a little bit. Here's my tip number six. One of the, the biggest challenges that we found is it's all well and good to wax poetic about monarch butterflies or any conservation need and get people to have a call to action and get them out there. But after you put that monarch garden in, who's going to care for it? It's really, really important to ensure that you have built ongoing relationships with um, either individual homeowners or community groups or stewards within the community who can care for those um, that monarch or other conservation habitat. Um, in June of 2015, we received a, a grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, here is Tom Melius of Region 3 coming down and presenting that to us on that day. And it was to do essentially uh, an expansion of our Milkweeds for Monarchs program, both in terms of science and research, but also in terms of education and outreach. So here on the left, you can see a map, and all of the little monarch icons are where we had um, research conducted and the uh, in monarch gardens and the little teeny tiny pink cone flowers are urban prairie patches and in these 37 areas we did three different types of research floristic diversity that was conducted by the missouri botanical garden we looked for pollinator abundance that was led by the st louis zoo and we looked at social impact and that was done by our partners at the university of missouri of st louis um, just briefly, the, um, well, in terms of the research on the pollinators and the vegetation, since we only had one growing season, there weren't any real definitive outcomes other than um, it's important to take care of these things, these areas, like the maintenance point I raised before. Mostly that information will serve as a baseline for future research. In terms of the social impact research, that was conducted in two phases. The first one was a rapid fire survey where we, the researchers at um, University of Missouri-St. Louis asked the participants a number of questions, which are listed right here, or how often do you visit, and so on and so forth. And we got some interesting results. Um, again, not definitive, but, but um, eye-opening. And one of the questions of the 141 folks taking the rapid fire survey was, is aesthetic beauty a benefit of the site? And 85% of the folks said, well, yes, it is. But also as instructive from my perspective is the fact that 15% said, no, it isn't. So why? Why not uh, a benefit to have one of these monarch gardens or prairie patches? And here are some of the comments that folks presented. Um, I think if you would summarize these, they kind of come down to it's really important to not just put in a garden or habitat area, but to ensure it is kept nicely. And um, it is, you have signage, 
potentially, you have the borders or mulching, um, but the appearance is really, really important for people to um, value it, at least for 15% of the people. Um, here is just an overall map of a number of different, a kind of a close-up of a number of different uh, monarch efforts. And if you look at these five circles, this is where they did a deeper dive study on the ethnographic questions of the social impact. And if you look at the little blue things here, these are little education caps, and these are schools. Um, here's my quick debate to help share the limelight because our partners at the zoo and the botanical garden and Brightside all put on amazing displays and programs to reach out to people. But they also led an effort to get into schools in the city of St. Louis. And uh, we just saw that there was an enormous potential to reach not just the children, but their educators uh, in the schools and their families as well. So it was a really great entryway to promote urban conservation regarding monarchs. So here's, what, here's our zoo, um, uh, botanical garden team, education team, and the 50 different schools and uh, the results of some of those efforts. In addition to that, we held a very successful educator and neighborhood specialist workshop. And we developed, they led the development of a new educator guide specifically oriented to creating school monarch gardens in the urban area. And that is now available online on um, at least the City of St. Louis website. And here is the cover of it. And at the end of this, I will have my, um, the URL, but you could also just Google City of St. Louis and Monarchs and I'll, all of these different resources that I'm showing will come up. So um, this is just another point about the impact of the before, during, and after of having kids participate in school monarch gardens. And segueing into tip nine, just make it fun. Make it festive. Make it easy. Um, here we've got monarch origami. We've got uh, monarch seed packets um, produced in, uh, in part supported by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service again. People love getting free things, even though um, it's harder to start a monarch garden from seeds. So, so that's a great thing to do. And here, um, make it fun and festive. You know, get the kids involved in doing art projects and showcase their work. And uh, here's another monarch garden um, habitat area along the Mississippi River. So I mentioned that uh, when people would register their monarch gardens, they could get one of these free monarch garden signs to put in their garden. And if you look on the right-hand side, it's a map of the 79 neighborhoods in the city of St. Louis. And right now you can see that almost that entire city has been covered with monarch icons. And these are 300 and I think we're up to 369 or something uh, monarch gardens that have been registered, created and registered. And there's even, I'm sure, a couple hundred more that haven't been registered in the city of St. Louis. Um, so this is, this is fun. People want to celebrate it. They want to talk about it. They want to take pictures. They want to upload their information. They want to showcase it with signs. And um, let them do that and let them be a part of it and experience it on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so just to summarize here, uh, my, my recommendations for urban monarch conservation successes. Here are my, my 10 tips. And I don't need to repeat them, but here they all are. And I'm sure this might be posted later. <laughs> you can go back and look at my 10 tips. Um, and we do have a report that we compiled, and it is also now uploaded to the city's website. And it is, looks like this, and it's uh, the first or second thing on our website. So if you want any of the details of the, uh, the research or the programs, all of those details can be found in the um, rather extensive report. And we probably don't have time for questions, but here is uh, the website, stlouis-mode.gov forward slash monarchs. And here is my email address if you'd like any further information about any of these things. Thank you so much, Catherine, for sharing with us. Um, we will move on to Nathan, who is, the, who is a muscle biologist for the Genoa National Fitch Hasher, Fitch, Fish Hatchery. <laughs> I'm going to talk specifically about freshwater mussel propagation. Um, I'm going to try to focus on our mobile aquatic rearing system 
and uh, and some of the other things that we do depending on the time. But muscle biologists are are really good at making new systems to raise animals. And even more than our creativity and our ingenuity for coming up with systems, we're also uh, pretty clever at uh, coming up with acronyms to name said systems. Again, I'm going to focus a lot today on our mobile aquatic rearing system, which we aptly have called the MARS. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we raise mussels on Mars or in Mars or however you would like to make those puns. To begin with, I need to talk very briefly about the freshwater mussel life cycle. Um, freshwater mussels are obligate parasites on fish. Freshwater mussels create a larvae that are host-specific. They have to attach to the gills, skin, or fins of specific types of fish. You see that illustrated in the life cycle here. We have an adult mussel at the bottom. This one has a mantle lure, um, looks like a fish. Mussels that create a lure that looks like a fish generally use predatory fish as their host. Um, this mussel would use a largemouth bass, as we've shown here. Our mussel larvae are shaped like a little Pac-Man. When they encounter fish, they grab a hold of whatever they can find. Most mussel larvae only attach or transform on the gills of a fish. Um, those particular species, if they attach to the skin or the fins, those juveniles are not going to be able to transform and uh, become a juvenile and grow on. But those that attach to the appropriate place, you see in the top left corner here, there's, a, there's an up-close view of a couple of gill filaments with a couple of muscles insisted in them. After the muscles have fully developed, um, and during the time that the muscles are on the fish, they take some nutrients from the fish's blood, they develop their foot, their digestive system, their gills, all of the internal anatomy for the animal develops. Uh, as a larvae, they simply have a shell and then a muscle to pull the shell closed. Um, the small picture on the right-hand side here, you see some juveniles that have dropped off the fish. The tongue-shaped um, appendage sticking out of the shell is what we refer to, refer to as the muscle's foot. Um, I'll gloss over this a little bit, but I want to just make a point of saying that muscle culture is probably a full century behind finfish culture. We've, it's only been relatively recently that we dis, that we knew for certain that a glochidia, that's the name of a muscle larvae, actually attaches to fish's gills, and it is a parasite-host relationship. Um, you know, for a long time we have known that. You put big fish in a pond, you'll get small fish back later. But it wasn't until 1866 that we accurately and everybody agreed that these were actually muscle larvae and that they attached to fish, and, and that's how the muscle life cycle goes. There's a lot of variety in the different glochidia or the different larvae um, that we have here in our mussels in North America. The larger things at the top that are somewhat triangular um, at the end of this point, you can see some hooks. These are larvae that are made to attach to the skin and fins. Um, muscles that attach to skin and fins are generally hooked to help them hold on. All of the round things in the middle and towards the bottom are uh, gill parasites. The ones in this lower left corner, the small ones tend to grow on the fish. Generally, everybody else drops off of the fish the same size they were when they came on the fish. But these, these ones in the lower left corner do, in fact, grow in size while they are on the fish. So I want to talk a little bit about what we do. Um, we are not a captive breeding program. We, we do not bring male and female mussels into captivity, spawn them there in a traditional fish hatchery sense. For, most, for, for all of our mussel propagation, we go to the wild, we collect females that are brooding viable larvae, we put them on the fish, and then from there we have different options. Um, the first and the easiest thing you can do is simply let those fish go. It's what we refer to as a free release. If you want to restore mussels in a stretch of river, you can put mussels on a thousand fish and go and turn them loose. 
and do it year after year after year or, or whatever number you choose. And we have documented in Iowa in multiple streams that we've been able to turn loose infested fish and build a population that way. Um, if we're not just letting the fish go, the next step is to hold the fish and you can either then to immediately release those juveniles or you can do these other things with them. Um, over the last 10 years, we have come to realize that your return rate is very, very low when you take those juveniles and try to release them the next day or two weeks or four weeks or six weeks after they have dropped off the fish. This is probably a time to talk about how small these animals are. Most of the freshwater mussels that we propagate drop off of their host fish between 200 and 350 microns. That's one-fifth to one-third of a millimeter. So very, very small. Um, so what we have come to at, at this point is a strategy of essentially growing all of the animals that we release to a size that we would we call them taggable. Essentially, we grow them up to about an inch where they're anywhere from a, a large marble out to a golf ball size before we turn them loose. Um, I have left off the use for research part of this discussion. That's just that's just a topic for another day. So issues at a fish hatchery. Um, again, we're going to the river and we're collecting wild mussels. And I also mentioned these mussels are host specific. How do you raise a mussel at a fish hatchery if that fish does not in fact occur in the area if you yourself don't raise it or, or what have you. Um, another issue we deal with is uh, muscle no uh, diet gaps, I'm sorry, knowledge gaps in muscle diet. We know that mussels feed on algae and bacteria, but we don't know exactly what fraction that they feed on of the different components that we run into in natural river water. We can effectively grow mussels in captivity using cultured algae, but generally we are more effective when we use warm, productive wild water. And again, as, as a fish hatchery here, here at Genoa, our reputation is based solely on the health certification that we receive from our fish health lab. If, if, a lot, if we have a lot of fish that tests positive for a certifiable pathogen, those fish have to be destroyed, and gen depending on the state, we may be put on probation from, from stocking in a given state for as much as three years until our health status returns to, to top shape. So anytime we bring things into the hatchery, we have to be very, very careful to make sure that we don't, we don't harm the hatchery. This is Genoa National Fish Hatchery. Um, the top part of your screen, the water you see out there is all the Mississippi River. I'd also call your attention, along the left side of the screen, you can see a stream flowing along the path that I'm moving the cursor here. That is a tributary to the Mississippi. When the Mississippi River floods, it backs up and it fills all of this green space in the lower right-hand corner when that happens, we are literally surrounded by wild Mississippi River water on three sides of the hatchery. Um, we haven't had the Mississippi over the dikes and in the hatchery since, I believe, the 60s, but the, uh, the flood of records can get above our dikes. And so I just want to drive home that we are very close to the Mississippi that has many known pathogens in it. All of the water we use on this station comes out of the ground. We have 13 wells on station that supply our ponds and we're able to move water from one pond to the next to keep that water on station and warm it up. But I want to speak specifically about our, our muscle trailer, our, our Mars trailer, and how it benefits us. And, and the reason is that we're able to put it 
along the stream and actually use Mississippi River water to run this trailer without ever actually letting the Mississippi River into the station. Here's an aerial view. Um, Juno and National Fish Hatcheries here at this top pin. We place the Mars trailer at a Corps of Engineers park approximately five miles away. By the time we get off the highway and, and work our way all the way back into where it is, it's about a 10 minute drive between. So it's, it's very comfortable for us to place the trailer and then go visit it once a day during the summer and just make sure that everything is okay. We are very fortunate to have a, a partner close by that will allow us to use the space and uh, you know we have good access to it. Uh, we don't have access to Mississippi River water at the hatchery anywhere close to electricity, so we needed to seek out this partnership in a location that we're largely not prone to flooding where we'd have to pull it out. The way the, again, the way the streamside trailer works is we take wild water and we give the mussels that we keep inside the trailer all of the different components of, of the wild water that we can't bring to them in the hatchery. So we are giving them a natural food component without any artificial diets. The water is the same temperature that they would be experiencing in the wild. Um, we use fiberglass tanks so that we're not releasing any ions into the water causing any contamination. And by, by putting flow on one end of the tank and a drain on the other, we're giving them a constant gentle river-like flow. So this is the inside of the trailer before we've added the tanks. Um, the mussels go in the individual tanks. Generally, we take last year's animals that are, say, fingernail size. And in a perfect world, you know, these four slides sum up what this trailer does. You take small animals, you put them in. At the end of the summer, you have big animals. Um, these are what we would refer to as a taggable size subadult. You can see there are black dots on several of these animals. Generally, we mark our muscles with a dot of black dyed superglue. This won't tell us which individual we have here, but it will tell us if we find them again, this muscle came from the hatchery because it has this black dot on it. So this is the path of the water through the Mars trailer. This cage that you see in the, in the, uh, in the stream has a five horse trash pump. That's, that's one eighth inch perforated aluminum. It serves to keep out the sticks, the leaves. Uh, it keeps animals away from the pump. That water, that pump pushes water up to the trailer where it goes to a drum filter. Our drum filter's set with screens at 90 microns. That, that filters everything out but the finest silt. Then we have a high intensity UV filter to help kill any viruses or bacteria that could potentially be um, pathogenic. You've seen this picture before. We, we put our mussels themselves in these fiberglass tanks. We put about a half inch of sand in the bottom. We give them a baffle to make sure that nobody can get out. We do have a blower in the trailer, which runs some aeration. Every now and then we'll have a failure on the pump. If the pump fails, we have an air stone to make sure that we don't lose, we don't lose oxygen in the tank itself. After the water's flowed over the animals, it discharges out the back end of the trailer. Um, we have a high intensity UV on the back end of the trailer. And then after the, after the water goes through that high intensity UV, we have a discharge pipe and the water goes right back where it came from. So our primary uses on the muscle side of the operation, we're Roughly, we're fairly evenly split between taking yearling animals and growing them to the size that we want to stock, or taking those newly metamorphosed juveniles directly off the host fish and growing them up to that first subadult size. For most of the mussels that we raise, you can get them anywhere from 
five mils to 25 mils in one growing season. Most of what we what most of what we propagate, we will hold through through a winter and release at the end of the second summer. Most of those animals will be 15 to 18 months old at that point, and usually we can get them in the 30 to 40 millimeter range or inch and a quarter to an inch and a half by the time that we release them. But again, we'll split the trailer for the warm months of the summer, generally half and half between last year's juveniles and new juveniles for this year to be released in the following year. I mentioned that we've got to be careful about bringing animals on station, and, and one of the one of the ways that we get around that with the muscle trailer is by, by quarantining small batches of fish. I put a picture of a, lo uh, a net full of log perch here in the lower right-hand corner. Log perch is a species that we use to propagate a fish, a mussel called the snuff box. And what, this is a fish that occurs in the, in the river, but it's not propagated at any commercial hatchery. So we will go out on the river and collect two or three or four hundred of them, a subset of those fish will go to our fish health lab. Their analysis will take us roughly a month to six weeks to complete. During that six-week period, we will put those log perch in the muscle trailer. We have a high-intensity UV on the front of the trailer, a high-intensity UV on the back side of the trailer, so that we can be assured that there's nothing pathogenic getting to those fish and if by chance they would have something pathogenic, that it's being killed by the UV on the back side of the trailer before it would potentially be released to the wild. So for subadults, um, again, these are usually about a 12-month animal when we put them in the trailer. For those animals that are 3 to 5 millimeters, we'll put roughly 300 in a tank. We try to measure their growth by percent because when a 10 mil animal grows one millimeter, it has grown 10%. But when a two mil animal has grown to 10 mils, that's actually 500% of its actual growth. So again, by going with percent growth, we kind of standardize for the initial size of the animal. Now, Obviously, smaller animals will tend to have a higher percentage if, if they all end up growing to 20, 25, or 30 mils over the course of the season. This has treated us very well. We generally, most of the time, we can go back to these tanks. We'll put the animals in them in May. When we go back in October, usually we recover every one that we put in the tank. There have been occasions where we have recovered less, but it's generally at least 98 or more percent of what we stocked. By the end of that second growing season, the animals are the size of what you see on the right hand of these pictures. They're big enough to get one of those glue dots and they are, they are ready to go out the door. We also will take newly metamorphosed juveniles from our laboratory and stock them into tanks in the Mars trailer. When we do this, we'll actually stock anywhere from three to 5,000 in a tank. Same premise applies. We may use a little less flow. We'll put a smaller screen so they can't get out. But particularly for the animals on the left-hand side of the screen, this has been very successful for us. Um, you can see we've, for four, three species, we've recovered over a thousand per tank in our best case scenario. Um, there are times whenever we, we don't recover any, but generally those have been pretty rare. The animals on the left are on the right-hand side, the snuffbox, pistol grip, and fawn's foot. You know, we're still trying to figure out what does it take to help us get better at those. We, that's part of how we're trying to work and get better is how do we move our results from the right-hand side over to the numbers you see on the left-hand side. But whenever we have a year where you get the numbers like you see on the left, we will hold those animals over the winter grow them up another season that following summer, and then hopefully they will be in that inch, inch and a quarter range, and we'll tag them and stock them at that point. I want to touch briefly again on uh, quarantining. Again, we can 
bring fish into the trailer, uh, particularly if uh, if we are outside of mussel holding season, we can bring mussel fish into the trailer and maintain the fish in the trailer during that six-week stretch while we are waiting on the fish health lab to to verify that 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 lot of fish does not have anything pathogenic. When we know that we have a clean bill of health on that lot of fish, we can bring them onto the grounds of the hatchery with a, a sense of confidence that they are not going to cause a disease when they arrive. Um, when Genoa National Fish Hatchery first got into the mussel propagation business, we developed what you see here, the, the mussel culture cage. This is, a, this is an angle aluminum frame wrapped in hardware cloth. It's essentially, it's essentially sitting on a card table. And I'll run through a series of slides to show you how they work. We will, in the lab, we take, you know we take the mussels and put them on their host fish. Then we coat, we coat the bottom of the cage with some sand to give those mussels okay. a place to live. My permit obligates me to, in the Mississippi and St. Croix rivers, I'm obligated to place these cages in at least six foot of water. And that, that uh, regulation is put in place so that uh, they are not an impact to boaters. Um, I'm sure you can imagine if I put this thing six inches from the water surface, um, it would be uh, quite the snag for um, anybody that would boat through the area. And they'd catch a lot of fishing lures as well. So I say all that to say we have to have scuba divers put these out. Um, we did make a system where we can actually float them in a rack, but uh, um, by and large, we're placing them out in wild locations on the Mississippi and St. Croix in anywhere from 6 to 12 feet of water. The divers take them out, place them in the stream. At the end of the season, we come back. In some cases, we go ahead and leave them over winter, and so we're coming out in September and October of the following season. And that's the next couple of slides I'll show you. These are, these are animals that have been out those two growing seasons. The, the cage comes up, we pour the contents of the cage through a set of nested sieves, spray them down, and, uh, and hopefully you have, as you see here on the screen, a bunch of yellow and green and brown mussels that you can pick up. Ultimately, this is what we're wanting to get to right here. You get to go out on a boat on the big river, you get to put these mussels in your hand and you say, okay, let's go, let's go stock these animals. Um, Again, we could drop off 100,000 juveniles in an aquarium in the laboratory, and they're half the size of a grain of salt. And you could put half a million of them in a one-gallon Ziploc and go to the river. And I've done this before. You, you bump into a fisherman, he's, you, know, you say, hey, I'm stocking mussels, and fishermen will be excited. No, all right, I like mussels. Let's, let's see. You pull a bag out of a cooler, and it looks like there's some salt in the bottom, you lose them right there. That's the end of your outreach when they see something that just looks like, again, just a pile of salt, a pile of sand in the bottom of a bag. But if you can say, here, I've got this, I've got this laundry sack that's got a 1,000 mussels in it, and they're all the size of a golf ball. Why don't you come along? Here's five or ten yourself. You go place them here, here, here. It's Number one, it's a much better outreach tool. And number two, these animals are much better equipped to survive in the wild when they are a two growing season animal. Again, when they're borderline golf ball size, they're much more resistant to predation and the other things that the environment's going to throw at them. So here are several, again, several examples of, uh, this is our, uh, one of our federally endangered animal, the Higgins eye. Um, several different cohorts. In the middle here, we've got a couple of young of the year animals that we've gotten up to five to 10 mils. And then the other pictures around the outside are those two-year animals. And in some case, yeah, these are all two-year animals that uh, have got more size on them. And it, in the lower right, you can see they've all been dotted with black glue and uh, they can go out the door and, and we'll know them when, the, when we see them later. We have been successful raising the species you see on the list here using our cages. Um, all of these we've recovered numbers far and away above what would be 
let's just say, worth the effort. Um, those of you that know muscle biology, it tends to be that the lamps aligns do pretty well in these muscle cages. Um, we have been marginally successful with several of the amblyomine species. You can see on the list here, um, and these numbers in parentheses are literally the number we've recovered in our efforts. So I feel real sheepish saying that we've been successful with sheep nose, even though we've recover, recovered just one. But it's more than we've done in our other methods. So again, this is a new field, and we are hoping that a lot of these efforts, even though they're mixed results for some of these species, that they are the beginning of a springboard to bigger and better things. Um, with the Higgins eye, for example, I believe it was in 2001, our first effort produced three subadult Higgins eye. And now we're at a place where we can produce 25,000 a year if we want to. We've actually throttled back production a little bit, but we have exceeded 25,000 subadults in a year um, during this effort. Um, again, here's a little rundown of the cage design. Um, angle aluminum frame with hardware cloth. It's a, a thin sheet of plywood riveted to angle aluminum base. Um, our dimensions, the way we make them, they're two foot wide and three foot long, being 18 inches high. This gives us plenty of space to put inoculated fish in. Most of what I put in these are largemouth bass, and I will use spring fingerlings that are four to six inches. I usually put anywhere from 20 to 30 inoculated fish in these cages when I'm using large fish like that, and, and they handle it just fine. We've done well having walleye in these cages. Channel Cat handle it just fine as well. Um, we haven't been as successful with some of these other alternative hosts in the cages, and we're, we're not sure if that's because the mussels don't handle that situation quite as well, or if it's that the host fish doesn't handle it as well, and maybe the host fish dies before the mussels can drop off. But those are, those are things that we need to keep working on, doing research and trying to figure out, you know, how can we make it better? You know, I feel like we're doing a whole lot of really good work here, but I'm kind of never satisfied. I always want to do a little more, do a little better, and, and look, to, look to improve our results. Um, that, is, that is what I have as far as uh, slides go. Uh, all right, well, thank you so much, Nathan and Catherine, for uh, this week's webinar. Um, remember, if you have questions for either um, of these presentations, uh, you can send them our way, or their contact information is on our website. Um, the recording of today will be available on our website probably tomorrow, so please look for that. And we'll hope. We we'll hope you all will join us next week. We will be having Bonnie Keeler from the University of Minnesota. She'll talk about her national um, capital project from uh, Iowa and Minnesota. They're targeting restoration based on demand, not just supply. And then we also have Craig Miller, who is our human dimensions tag coordinator. They did a mail survey where they asked about land use value orientations, land ethics, and responsibilities, and he'll talk about that research that he's done. And for those of you that aren't familiar with our Alphabet Soup, TAG is Technical Advisory Group, um, and we have four of them, uh, prairie restoration, uh, big river restoration, uh, urban conservation, and agroecology. So most of the presentations over the next couple of weeks will be focused around those topic areas, and as they are broad, um, you'll see that most of our, to our uh, presentations um, spread that entire spectrum. Um, and thanks.